Support for Conversations with Elle McFarland was provided by Old National Bank Comcast Home Ownership Opportunity Alliance and North American Banking Company I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. I'm pleased to have as a guest for this program my friend, uh, leader and elder in community, Alfred Babington Johnson. Uh, Brother Babington, as we call you, how you doing? Thank you for being here. I'm doing nicely, Al, uh, and I consider it always a pleasure and an honor to be with you. Well, just to talk to you is always uh, uh, enlightening for me. I think uh, what you have to say, uh, both from your experience but also the quality, of uh, analysis and presentation uh, are all of, always of benefit to me personally and I think to the community as well. Let me begin by saying this edition of Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by Comcast, which is working to bridge the digital divide through internet essentials and partnering with organizations across Twin Cities uh, to help make our region an even better place to live. So we thank Comcast Internet Essentials for their support. Uh, your work as a community builder uh, is critical. For the past generation, uh, you and I have worked together uh, talking about sort of a crying from the mountaintop uh, that uh, freedom is at hand, liberty is at hand, redemption is at hand. Mm -hmm. It's and in our hands. It's in our hands, right? <laughs> and so talk about uh, the stair-step mission, the stair-step yeah. vision, uh, stair-step initiative, the movement, first of all. And then we'll go into other things that you've okay. done specifically. Well, let me begin by saying how much I appreciate our uh, decades-long collaboration and partnership built around the fact that we both believe the importance of community. Uh, that that is the issue of our times. The breakdown of the community has resulted for African Americans in all manner of horrible outcomes that are called disparities, whether you talk of economics or health or whatever it might be. And so uh, our intention, and again, early on, you joined me because you were already in the fray yourself uh, in, in uh, the early 1990s, matter of fact, 1991 and two, in the development of the Stair Step Initiative in which we say we want to understand what are the components, what are the processes, what are the dynamics that are required to rekindle and, and, and energize the spirit of community among African American people. Let me say this, Al, I recognize that ultimately we need a, a revitalized community in the world mm -hmm. of all people. Mm -hmm. uh, our focus on African Americans and those of African descent is because that's where the disparities sit uh, and, and, and have the most devastating impact. So we've got to treat home first, then charity mm -hmm. spreads abroad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's where we are, and mm. that's who we are. And in a sense, uh, I would say, uh, Jerry Rawlings said uh, mm. in one of, of our Ghana. visits, of Ghana, in one, in one of our president. visits, I think that uh, that's our unique assignment ah. as Africans in the West. Come on now. We've got an assignment, and the assignment is to move towards and advance this question of the liberation of hum human beings. Amen. You know, I and think but you Jerry, start from within. Well, I think Jerry Rawlings and Mahmoud El Khati uh, hung out in some of the same places, <laughs> drinking the same water. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, Stair Step did that with intentionality. When you caught the vision, uh, what did you see? What was uh -huh. in your mind's eye? Uh, uh, Martin Luther King calls it the beloved community. I do believe that it is uh, an assignment of God and the concern of God. Uh, my own theology says, first of all, he wants us to trust him. That's his top priority. The second is he wants us to be in love with one another. He wants us to recognize our connectivity and the fact that if, if we rise, we rise. Um, and so uh, what I see uh, is uh, a new consciousness a new awareness, and, and recognizing too, Al, that we are fighting against forces that don't want connectivity, that don't want rise, you know, that get to be very insular and, and, and cancerous. So, so we have to intentionally, and I think that's a word that we both love, <laughs> intentionally, get about the business of connecting and get about the business of rising together. You work with churches, mm. you work with businesses, mm. you work with uh, youth, with education, with health. Uh, sort of go over some of the initiatives in the Stair Step Initiative. 
Well, uh, first and foremost, the we're not an agency. We are an initiative, and our goal is community and community building. And so after 20, almost 30 years being after that, we have learned some things, and we have seven kind of op parading philosophical principles that guide us forward. First is you gotta have, know what the values are that you're fighting for. What are the historic values important for African Americans, currently relevant, ought to be pressed in the future. Um, but, but one of the central themes for us too is the development and the reinforcement of our institutions. The point here being, we are we we're sort of trapped in this space where everybody wants to be the lone ranger and just and feel like it's okay if it's just me and mine. Um, that's destructive on its face, uh, and strategies that are just individually centered are not going to get us where we need to be. So one of our sense of things is that if we can get the institutions of our community engaged. Uh, they can, to use a metaphor, become a circulatory system with nodes or a highway system with, with stops. And, and that we can use to carry strategies that move our community forward. We think that the key institution that has the greatest potential in this regard is the African American church. It has historical credibility. It's, always, it's the bridge that brought us over. Uh, it is ubiquitous. Everywhere you look, there's one, you know. And the potential of it, if you even look at things like cash flow uh, or access to communications, your specialty, the church has all those possibilities. Can we engage it? And can we uh, build capacity for the church to, to operate in this role as well? That's one of the central things we are doing. You, you focus on health as well. Mm. You've moved to the discussion about the health of our community to uh, equating that or describing it as a function of the spirit. Mm, okay. So let me say this though. Our goal is community building. Mm -hmm. We find targets of, of strategic opportunity all across the landscape because they're issues that negatively impact us. So our notion, Al, is if we see an issue that's critical to us, if we can find a way to mobilize a strategy and an effective impact using the institutions of the community, then we've got a, a, a double bottom line benefit, if you will. The, the issue has been dealt with or is being dealt with, but the community is being strengthened. So a lot of times people mistake the stair step for being about economic development or health disparities or youth or whatever. When in point of fact, we may take on these issues individually, but our point is always to do it in such a way mm -hmm. that we strengthen the fabric of the community so we've got capacity afterwards to deal with any number of other issues. So you talked about economic development. Mm -hmm. One of the major forays was the development of entrepreneurship and businesses. Mm -hmm. And you've moved the discussion and the expectation mm -hmm. of our community, of individuals and the community forward, I believe. Uh, what have been your successes in that arena? The success is, uh, it, I'll, I'll kind of zero in on Cieza, which was a manufacturing plant we put together with collaboration of General Mills and Glory Foods out of uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, that manufacturing plant that we built and that we produced in uh, over a period of a little over 10 years had uh, $12 million in payroll and 400 individuals who had jobs that came out of that. But more important than that was the fact that we got black folk to invest. We got black folks to believe that we could together. We could manage, we could move forward. It was a creation of a model. And the model was celebrated as it ought be. Uh, and you know, with a, an award in the Oval Office for Bill Williams and General Mills and for Stair Step. But the point is in collaboration, we have strength. In collaboration, we can advance. Whatever the arena is, economics, health, education, whatever it might be. We've got to understand the lesson and the message underneath. The experience, the enterprise, the example is fine, but do you get the message? Working together, we can do anything. Mm -hmm. In education, you mm -hmm. focused on belief bowl. Yes. How do we get our kids to see ourselves yes. uh, differently? Yes. Or see ourselves truly? Yes. You know, I gotta take my hat all the way off to Eric Mahmoud, uh, who wrote a book, I believe, called Best in Class. In it, he looked at the, at the educational challenge that we're facing, and he defined it. You know what, Al? This is something you've known and, and operate in forever as I've known you. If you can define a problem, 
you had a lot better chance of impacting and solving it. Well, that's what Eric did in his book. He talked about uh, not just a gap in, in educational achievement, but gaps, five gaps, uh, preparation. And, but the key gap he came to was belief. The question is, what do the children believe about themselves? What it messages have we uh, forced on them that end up creating the reality that they operate in? And if the belief is that you've just got this limited capacity, God bless you, then, then we get bad outcomes. But he talks about the growth mindset. Bring the muscle. The more you use it, stronger it gets. Oh my goodness, is that the deal? Well then how do we share that with others? And how do we uh, actually demonstrate that in, pro in practical ways? And we did the belief bowl using the churches mm -hmm. to try to advance that notion. Mm -hmm. A lot of great things. Let's talk about then this, uh, what it's all about. So it's not about the particular exercise mm -hmm. or project, but it's about changing the mind yeah. uh, of our community. Yeah. I call it uh, creating a public mind, Amen. revealing the public mind, Amen. a mind and awareness that sort of uh, lets us know who we have been, who mm. we are, mm. and who we can become. And who we can be. Who Amen. we can become. Yeah. And it celebrates yeah. what we've yeah. been yeah. in an environment that denigrates mm. what we've been. <laughs> uh, the denigration is untrue. Yes. You know, it's, uh, we've been flooded by falsehoods, yes. and the falsehoods intend to diminish our spirit, our impact, and our potential. Absolutely. But I think we're greater than that. We know Amen. it. And our job is to tell it and to tell it to the world. And see, thank God for McFarland Media uh, and, and how seriously you take the issue of the story, the narrative. Mm -hmm. If we accept the narrative that is foisted upon us by others, we are in a very small, dark, difficult place. But if we start with the truth of our history, and then if we look inside at our own potential, and if we look across and see our brothers and our sisters and start to see the possibilities that exist, then we reject the narrow, dark, difficult narrative, and we reject the notion of simply reacting to what somebody else wants to say or do about us, and we become in an aspirational place, in a proactive place, where we're saying, hey, you know what, I've got a dream, mm -hmm. and I'm going for it. And I've got a solution for humanity. Hello. Yeah, I've got an answer <laughs> for existence, right? Amen. And if we see ourselves uh, connected to the eternal, uh -huh. the eternal reflected in us, uh -oh. it gives us a different power, different ahead, perspective, preach, preacher. more confidence. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, you know, this is what I think our generation has come to and come from. Mm. And we're not new in this. We're standing on the shoulders of Amen. people before us who have decided that this is a fight worth fighting. Amen. I think our job, uh, Brother Badminton, yours and mine has been to say uh, that we are worthy to stand in Amen. the arena Amen. and to believe that we will win. Amen. And so we get up every day fighting and proving. And uh, believing. And believing. Yes. And delivering, you know, and we, yes. we get beat up sometimes <laughs> and it's okay. Comes with the territory. Comes with the territory. Yes. And so when I ask you to focus on vision, mm. uh, where do you see us going? How do you see uh, what outcomes are in your mind? Temporal and spiritual. Well, spiritual, more importantly for me, Al, because uh, the, the, the temporal will, re, will reflect the, spiritual. the truth yeah. of what is in my spirit. That's right. You know, and, uh, and so in my spirit, I do want to honor God. Mm -hmm. I do want to recognize that I am because he is, mm -hmm. you know, and my opportunities uh, exist and abound because of his love and care for me and you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I start there. Then I want to recognize the impact of my connectedness with my brothers and my sisters. You know, that's a lifting, a lifting proposition mm -hmm. you know uh, the the self thing is a is a is a capsulating sort of thing you know uh, but the more I really recognize the power that comes each time that I sit down with it we get to exchange I'm energized mm -hmm. I'm improved you know I'm ready to take something else on. <laughs> uh, and so the more I realize the benefit that flows from that connectedness, then I create that reality. I walk in that reality. Uh, that's what my vision is, Al, that more and more we'll awake to the potential, the benefit of being together. 
I would say this uh, in addition, my take on that is uh, mm -hmm. our capacity to recognize the presence of the Creator in each of us. Amen. So when I look at you, I'm looking at uh, the work of God, Amen. right, and Amen. that presence, and I, I salute that, Amen. and my goal is to imitate that as Amen. well. Amen. So Brother Badminton, thank you so much. Can I say something yes, real quick yes, about sir. another partner, and that is Comcast. They've really blessed us and helped us. Uh, we're working with them on uh, the project that they're doing called Internet Essentials. Mm -hmm. And it recognizes one of the dangers of this time is the fact that many people uh, that are our brothers and sisters don't have access to the Internet, don't have access to technology, what have you. And so we really do value what Comcast has done in helping us help them mm -hmm. tell that story across our community. Well, the key for me is uh, to talk about them for the modeling that they are doing. We Amen. want other companies Absolutely. to step up because uh, we each are stakeholders in each other's existence. Amen. And our value must be recognized and responded to. And to the degree that Comcast invests in our communities, mm -hmm. our projects, we think that's the right thing to Absolutely. do. So we thank them for that. Amen. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. My guest, Alfred Babington Johnson, the leader, creator of the Stair Step Initiative. Alfred, thank you so much. Hey, Brother you Babington, thank God you so much. You, All right. <laughs> We'll see you next time. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. This edition of Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by Comcast, working to bridge the digital divide through internet essentials and partnering with organizations across Twin Cities to help make our region an even better place to live, work, and play. I'm pleased to have as my guest uh, today, Ruben Velas Vasquez. Vasquez. Ruben Vasquez. Ruben Vasquez is the uh, Vice President for Racial Justice and Public Policy at the YWC. CA of uh, Minneapolis. It's a great organization and a, a great challenge. Let me tell you a little bit about him. I'm sort of reading from his bio, uh, <laughs> if you let me do that, uh, Ruben. For sure. Uh, let's see. So, uh, Vice President of Racial Justice and Public Policy at YWCA Minneapolis, responsible for overall leadership and strategy for YWCA Minneapolis's race and equity race equity and public policy programs in support of the WISE mission, vision, and goals, uh, and particularly in the areas of quality program and event delivery, of program development, implementation and evaluation, budget development and management. He represents the why on racial justice and public policy issues, both locally and nationally. He joined the why in November of 17 as the racial equity and public policy strategist. Uh, and he joined to provide strategic leadership, uh, proactively built community partnerships and to manage seamless integration of the Y's Minneapolis, uh, Y Minneapolis's race equity initiatives among partners and members. Um, he came to this country from Mexico some 35 years ago. Uh, you've been committed, Ruben, uh, in working to uh, support, serve, identify, uplift under and unrepresented mm -hmm. communities, helping our people become uh, primary stakeholders in our mm -hmm. communities. Your philosophy is that diversity is what makes us different and inclusion is how we incorporate those differences right. to yield stronger organizations and I think stronger people stronger, as well. Yeah. Uh, you've got a master's degree in public administration from Hamlin University and a certificate in global arbitration law and practice from Hamlin Law School and Queen Mary University in London. Mm -hmm. uh, you are an active member in a number of organizations in Twin Cities. Uh, you and your wife married 15 years, right? Two children, ages 13 and 10, uh, and you live in New Brighton. Correct. That's the story. That is the and story. And you're sticking to it, right? I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, thank you so much for being here, and thanks to the uh, why for its bold and forward-thinking mm -hmm. leadership, creating a discussion, changing the narrative mm -hmm. about race, diversity, and inclusion. But when the question comes up, uh, what's the elevator speech? Why are we doing this work? 
So why are we doing this work? I think this, the reason why we're doing this work is because, uh, especially in our current political climate, mm -hmm. I think this work is no longer something that is a nice thing to do, mm -hmm. but it's a must thing to do, right? Our mission is, like you said, it's a bold mission. It is a big mission. It is to eliminate racism. It is to empower women and young girls. Um, and we recognize that that is a big, bold mission, but it is a mission that um, I personally feel that it is attainable through, um, you know, we use different strategies to get to that point, but really it's about getting to a point of having conversations that must be had at this point, mm -hmm. where before it was more of a nice thing to do, and now sure. it's a must thing to do. Actually, before it was, don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. Don't right. talk about it. And, it it and was a nice thing to do specifically within communities of colors and right. within communities of colors. Right. As a person of color, it was something that we kept on pushing, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, the dominant community kept mm -hmm. on kind of be like, we're okay, we're good, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. We elected a black president, yeah, we got yeah, there, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and in fact, the, the challenge was that uh, when we pointed out instances of inequity mm -hmm. and unfairness that, that we perceived as uh, consistent, apparent, and structural, we often were met with denials saying that that was an individual instance, right. one bad actor, one bad situation, but never linking uh, the continuum right. of negative energy that served in total to uh, consistently uh, derail uh, our inclusion and our involvement and, our, and diminish our sense of dignity. Or it was also uh, seen as something that maybe it was something that you did wrong. That's right. That you put yourself in that situation. Right. Yeah. If you would have done it this other way, mm -hmm. you would have been okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? You know, as an example, something that happened to me personally a few years ago, um, four years ago actually, on the 4th of July, my family and I were visiting Michigan uh, on the 4th of July and you know, it's part of me that immediately when I walk in, I start scanning the room to see who else looks like me, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Am I really, really the only person? And what, that's one of the things I did here, and we, it was the outdoors. And immediately I realized I was the only person of color in the crowd, mm -hmm. uh, in this crowd. I just happened to be wearing a T-shirt that said Mexico. Mm -hmm. Didn't even think anything of it, mm -hmm. right? But it was because I was wearing that T-shirt that said Mexico that I was pulled out of the crowd by immigration. Just like that. Oh, boy. And started being questioned oh as to my legal status, my mm -hmm. criminal history, mm -hmm. my employment, mm -hmm. you know, why I married the person I married, if mm -hmm. it was because of papers. I mm -hmm. mean, all of these mm -hmm. things, right? Mm -hmm. After that whole awful, awful mm -hmm. experience, my 10-year-old son was with me at mm -hmm. that point, and he literally asked me on the spot was, Papa, why is this happening? Mm -hmm. My response to him was, because I'm brown, mm -hmm. right? And the officer said, are you insinuating that I'm racially profiling you? And I said, no, actually I'm not. I'm stating a fact, right? And his thing is, well, it's because you're wearing that T-shirt. So it was my fault <laughs> that I was wearing the T-shirt, <laughs> right, right? right? And my thing is, that's, if I live in a country that is horrible. free, yeah. right? Yeah. Why is this an issue? And right. if my T-shirt would have said something other than Mexico, if it would have said Poland, mm -hmm. Germany, France, would I have been pulled out of that crowd, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just about that there's a lot of times when these people see this as individual incidents, but more often than not, they blame the victim mm -hmm. for being in the wrong spot at so, the wrong time. So, so how does an organization like the YW, first of all, adopt the strategy, the the attitude, uh, the commitment to tackle this thing head on and to tackle it boldly, that's number one. Yeah. And then secondly, uh, how do you internalize that so that the organization itself reflects mm -hmm. the intent and the yeah. desire? Because the same problems uh, that are out in community are in yeah. every organization exactly. and in every family, you know? Yeah, so that is an Excellent question. And, you know, obviously when I came on board and took on this role, um, you know, in January of 2018, 
that was one of the first things I started figuring out. It's like it's not enough to have these conversations externally and with community, but how are we having those conversations internally? Mm -hmm. How are we engaging our staff so that our staff understands that uh, whether it's all the way from the top, whether it's the president, CEO, or the chair of the board, all the way down to the person who's checking in our, get, our members at the front desk, do they really see themselves as being part of the mission, or are they just going on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. doing their job? Mm -hmm. Right. So for me and my team, we have been uh, very intentional and very strategic about how do we start embedding the mission not just externally, but more importantly, internally, mm -hmm. so that everybody within the organization understands that when they come into work every day, they are working towards that mission mm -hmm. of eliminating racism and empowering women, and not just coming in to collect a paycheck. Mm -hmm. And so the embedding then becomes a, sort of a, a double uh, activity to embed within the organization, but the effective embedding in the organization means that uh, there has to be effective embedding and adoption by the individuals, by the staff. So right. that the people who work there right. truly understand and reflect and yeah. vocalize, verbalize, and they walk and talk in ways that reflect yeah. uh, the uh, practices that uh, suggest uh, the uh, setting aside right. of those things that right. are, have been historically. Yeah, and you know, it, Obviously, it's, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, it is, it, you know, going against the grain mm -hmm. or going against the status quo is mm -hmm. not always a popular thing to do. But, you know, like I said at the beginning, it is time for us to, we must start having these conversations and understand what is, what, when we're talking about racial justice, what do we mean by that? What does that look like? What is your role in that mission? whether you are a person of color, whether you are a white person, whether you are the chair of the board, whether you are the front desk person, what is all that, how does, what role do you play mm -hmm. in that, you know? So, you know, for us it's really more about how do we start embedding that mission internally because it, my belief is that once we start embedding it internally, that will then yield more results externally. And so when I hear you say external results, I think about driving past some of your buildings mm -hmm. and I see this bold declaration right. of eliminating racism. I say, dang, yeah. they're really saying, I mean, just, just to say it right. uh, is huge. You know, and mm -hmm. if you're doing it too, that's even better. better. But to say it in an environment that in the past said, uh, shush, Right. We don't talk about this. Right. It's not us. We're, we're liberals. We're Minnesotans right. and we're nice. Yeah, we it's Minnesota nice. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's bold. So what impact do you seek and what are you discovering yeah. uh, that the move is having on the business environment, the social service environment, uh, all those elements that make up the ecosystem yeah. that uh, ultimately form uh, the ability to have people be living free from discrimination and from racism? So the impact um, that we want to create is to build awareness. Mm -hmm. To, you know, one of the things I tell my team uh, is our job is to build awareness, but it's also to push people out of their comfort zone, right? How do we start having these conversations out in the community where these conversations, like you said, right? have really never been had because it makes people feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I get it, it's an uncomfortable thing to do. But our work is uncomfortable when we're talking about racial justice, right? It is not an easy thing to do. So for us is the impact that we're trying to create is that build that awareness out in the community, whether it's with community members, with business leaders, with other organizations, is to say, you are a part of this community. What role do you play mm -hmm. in helping to eliminate racism, right? whether you are a player in continuing to perpetuate that racism or whether you are a player in trying to eliminate it. Mm -hmm. Pushing those individuals to see what role they play in, right? Um, again, I, as a person of color, as an immigrant, as somebody who used to be undocumented when I first moved to this country, I, I understand that firsthand what it's like, mm -hmm. right? Um, I came here when I was in fourth grade. It wasn't until the ninth grade that I was allowed to have friends over my house because oh. of that fear, mm -hmm. right? So what role is the system playing to continue to perpetuate those mm -hmm. systems of oppression and that racist 
system that we live in right now. So our goal is to advocate, to build the awareness, and to push people for them to understand what role do they play and how can we as a collective move forward together. We're down to the last minute or so, uh, Ruben Vasquez, but I want to focus on, on Ruben mm -hmm. and your story. And uh, think back, you said you came here when you were four years old. Uh, what was your dream of what your life could be, uh, what your new country would be, and what role you'd play in that? So I w when I came here, I was in fourth grade. I was 10 years old. Okay, fourth grade. Yeah. yeah. Um, and really, it was, you know, my parents came here. They brought us here because they felt that this was a better environment for us. Um, I remember seeing snow for the first time in December of 1979, right? And for me, you know, I remember, and I tell my kids the story now, is the first day of school, um, when I was enrolled in school, at the end of that, I didn't speak a word of English. And the first, very first thing I learned in English were A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. And I remember being so proud of that. I came home and I was telling my mom, like, hey, I know how to speak English mm -hmm. because I could say four letters, sure. right? So for me, it was about being a part of a community that accepts me for who I am, right? And not being, um, having to hide. Uh, because like I said, for so many years, we had all of these rules at home, right? My parents never went to a parent-teacher conference mm -hmm. from fear of sure. that authority figure. Sure. If there was an issue going on, we could never call the police because of that authority figure. Mm -hmm. So for me, my goal, my dream is how do we get to a place where we do live in an equitable community, mm -hmm. where everybody's treated equal, right? Again, we're not necessarily asking for a handout. We're just asking for the opportunity to to become be our, better, to, to be, be ourselves. Be ourselves. To be our right, authentic exactly, selves. Exactly. Yeah. Listen, Ruben, uh, Ruben Vasquez, you are Vice President for Racial Justice and Public Policy at YWCA in Minneapolis. Thank you so much for Thank you. being here. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your story. Uh, I think it's an important story, a powerful story, and I think the organization is absolutely right for taking the stand it's taking and continued success in all that you do. Thank you so much. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. This edition of Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by Comcast, working to bridge the digital divide through internet essentials and partnering with organizations across Twin Cities to help make our region an even better place to live, work, and play. Organizations like the Minneapolis Urban League. I'm pleased to have as a guest for this program, Stephen Belton. Stephen Belton is an attorney, an experienced executive, a community leader, and uh, is the CEO of the Minneapolis Urban League. Uh, Background-wise, Stephen earned a BA in political science from Washington University, uh, JD from University of Michigan Law School. He's completed the majority of his requirements for the master's degree in divinity. Is that done yet or still working in still that direction? Work in progress. Still working in progress. Okay. And uh, uh, at, at Luther Theological Seminary in St. Paul and married for nearly 30 years to the Honorable uh, Sharon Sales Belton, the former mayor of Minneapolis. Stephen and Sharon have three adult children. Uh, you've worked uh, as a... Uh, uh, executive Director, Chief of Staff, Employee Relations Director, uh, Director of Diversity and Equal Opportunity at the Minneapolis Public Schools. You were a partner and litigator at Leonard Street and Dinard, Diner or Dinard? Diner. Diner, okay, where you specialized in employment, product liability, and family law. And now uh, you are providing just tremendous and valuable leadership as President and CEO. Uh, of the Minneapolis Urban League. You've worked with the Urban Coalition, you've worked with the Council on Black Minnesotans, and you currently serve as a youth minister. Uh, and you're a preacher 
at the United Methodist Church in South Minneapolis. That's wonderful. Steve, uh, welcome to Conversations with Alan McFarland. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Alan. Let me add one correction, if I may, which Please. I will be held accountable for if I don't correct. And that is, uh -huh. I have been married to the Honorable Sharon Sellsbelton for 38 years. Not 34. <laughs> Not 34 this is a, years. This, this a, is an old it, note. It's an so old note, yeah. So 38 years and... Yeah, 38 wonderful years. I need to say that. So. Absolutely. And uh, a wonderful human being, uh, a great mayor, great uh, citizen, great leader in our community. And so I think, uh, you know, the two of you uh, mirror greatness and what thank greatness uh, represents in our community and in family. So thank you both. So, you know, Urban League is a legacy institution. I'm so glad that you are there. I'm glad because, Steve, I know you to be a uh, powerful, effective organizer, uh, a great orator, a person who speaks without fear uh, and speaks with clarity and conviction, a person that's a doer and a demander. And the demands you make are demands that are founded in uh, the truth of our experience or our predicament, but in the expectation that good will prevail. And so you strike out every day challenging the status quo and calling on all of us to come up and be better. And you do that and you give uh, that body of, uh, of energy to the work at the Urban League. So that's my personal introduction of you. Speak to that. Uh, what drives you? What's the mission now as the leader of our legacy institution, the Minneapolis Urban League, I think soon to be Twin Cities Urban League? Yeah, we are relentless and unapologetic advocates for equity, justice, and power for African descendants in the Twin Cities. And all, each of those words in that mission statement uh, it was deliberately chosen. So relentless and unapologetic because the forces of white supremacy and racism are relentless and unapologetic. Mm -hmm. And we need to have an organization that is standing up to them in the same ways. We are not going away. The Urban League movement nationally has been around for over 100 years, and our affiliate here in the Twin Cities has been around for over 94 years. And so we've been here a while. We're going to be here a while. So relentless and unapologetic advocates because that's exactly what we are. We are, we advocate for policies, we advocate for programs, we advocate for resources that are equitable, equitably distributed. And equity in this case does not mean equal. And so we have been held back through deliberate policies of discrimination through the manifestations of a white supremacist system for so long that to simply give us an equal share would continue to relegate us to second-class citizenship, and that's unacceptable. So we are relentless and unapologetic advocates for equity, justice, and power, because that's the objective here. We're trying to get equity and justice and power for our community. Uh, for African descendants recognizes that it's we no longer work for just African Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, the Urban League movement got started as a result of the Great Migration back in the 20s when black people were moving from the south mm -hmm. to escape Jim Crow and looking for opportunity in the newly industrialized north and they needed an organization to help translate what was going on in the cities and that experience. So people came to the Twin Cities in Chicago and Cincinnati trying to figure out where do I get my hair did, where do I get a job, where the church is at, where can I get some barbecue. And so the Urban League stepped into that void. Uh, but now we are receiving African descendants from all over the globe. And mm -hmm. So obviously in the Twin Cities, significant East African population, but also West Africans and Caribbeans. And so the Twin Cities is a microcosm of the diaspora of African people from around the country, and this Urban League needs to be responsive to those needs. You know, there was a time when I think um, uh, some in public policy leadership questioned the validity, the value of maintaining legacy institutions like the Minneapolis Urban League, yep. like the NAACP, like Sabathany Community Center, like uh, the Halley Q. Round, uh, uh, MLK, Wheatley. Sure. Phyllis Wheatley. Sure. And the premise was we've arrived at the society where we don't have to recognize or speak about Post racial, uh, racial sure. identity, sure. racial problems. But you and I know that that has, is not true. It's, right. it's a lie on its face. It is. And those who perpetrate that thought have an intent, and the intent is to further marginalize and deny genuine opportunity engagement and deny the sharing of power yeah. with those of us who are making a demand for power. Speak to that. So if I were had my uh, preaching hat on, I would say it's a lie of the devil, mm -hmm. and I rebuke it. <laughs> <laughs> so the fact is that uh, our legacy organizations have been subject to a deliberate or negligent 
uh, practice and policy of disinvestment uh, over several years. And so what we have seen in our organizations is what's happened in our community. We know that our community has been subjected to disinvestment, mm -hmm. public disinvestment, private disinvestment. In, in our community organizations, our legacy organizations, which reflect and support the community, have suffered from that same disinvestment. And so I've actually asked for uh, some academic study about this issue to be able to track what has happened over time. So just as one example, the Minneapolis Urban League uh, in 2010 uh, actually, it was more like 2009, received uh, an allocation from the United Way, the Twin Cities, of $1.1 million. In each of the succeeding 10 years that follows, there was a disinvestment or a lowering of that allocation by over $100,000 until in 2016 we were notified by the Twin Cities Urban League that they would no longer fund United the Urban Way. League. Zero, I'm sorry, the United Way, mm -hmm. sorry. That they would zero fund. Um, the Urban League. And so we went from $1.1 million in 2009 to zero dollars beginning in the, their program year that began 2016-2017. Now, the United Way would say, and I'm not trying to defend their practice because it was horrendous and I think it was deliberate and intentional, but they would say that we don't fund programs, we don't fund agencies, we fund program areas. Mm -hmm. Well, that's nonsense it's because it's just double speak. If, for example, you say you're going to support um, battered women's programming and domestic abuse, then you're going to support, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Tubman, Harriet Tubman Shelter because they're the largest provider of those services. If, as the United Way did in 2017, decide we're no longer going to fund domestic abuse, and uh, uh, then they are making the decision while they say that we decided we're going to fund this program area, they also defunded Harriet Tubman. And that's essentially what they did with the Urban League over a 10-year period of time. And so we know that our organizations have either been targeted intentionally, some would argue have conspiracy theories about backroom. I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I think it's been neglect, and I think it's been in part because uh, white people have decided that this is a problem that, that they can't fix, or they just have become comfortable with the disparities and with the mistreatment, with the racist policies that impact the lives of African descendants. They are okay with it as long as we don't, you know, until something crazy happens, until we have uh, Philando Castile or till mm -hmm. Jamar Clark mm -hmm. is murdered by the police and then the community erupts, then there's a lot of attention paid to it. Or until you get a report in the New York Times that says the Minnesota is worse than Mississippi in terms of its economic uh, Not because white people care, because the philanthropic community cares anymore. It's simply a matter they're embarrassed and they don't want the attention. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. My guest is Stephen Belton. Stephen Belton is the CEO of the Minneapolis Urban League. Uh, in the spirit of disclosure, let me uh, tell our listeners and viewers that uh, I presently am a board member of United Way, and I have been uh, both a board member and chairman of the board of the Minneapolis Urban League. Yep. And so I want that to be on the table so that uh, you know Absolutely. everybody is clear on that. Yep. So, And you and I are clear on that. And, and we're so, clear on that, you yeah, know. Yeah. And, and so, uh, and my point then as a, a journalist and a communicator is uh, to continue to champion the interests of our people. Uh, it, it's all about how we uh, continue our march towards equity, towards freedom, uh, towards the recognition of our uh, right and our responsibility to live dignified and fair uh, and lives that have access to the things we pay for Absolutely. as citizens of this country. And up to now, we have been shortchanged. We have. Been. And we continue to be shortchanged. And I think it's by the structure of power and sometimes it's by misinformation on our side. We fear yeah. rocking the boat. That's true. You don't. I don't. Well, I, you know, part of my faith is that uh, everyone has a prophetic responsibility. And there's two kinds of prophetic uh, power. There's the uh, prophetic power that is the ability to speak truth in advance. Mm -hmm. And then there's the prophetic responsibility to speak truth to power. And so not everyone has the ability to um, a foretelling is mm -hmm. what we call it. Not mm -hmm. everybody can, you know, know what's going to happen in advance. You know, be an Isaiah mm -hmm. as an example. But everybody can, tear, can share in the responsibility for foretelling. And that is speaking truth and specifically speaking truth to power. And so I regard it as part of my 
It's part of my faith. It's part of their responsibility. But I was also raised by fearless people. And mm -hmm. so my mother and my father were both fearless. And they both came up from the South and specifically came from Kansas City, Missouri, which was very South. Which is the where time. I'm from. Exactly. <laughs> right. yeah. So you, you know from That's where right. I speak. That's right. So they came up from there, but they had the view that, um, you know, you go out into the world and you make a difference. You mm -hmm. bring value, you add value, and you care about the people. And so I regard myself as a servant. Uh, that's what I'm doing. That's why I'm at the Urban League now. It is part of my call. I'm not preaching at the Urban League. I'm not leading a religious organization, but it is very much a call. The, uh, Mark Moriel, the president of the National Urban League, when he recruited me for this job uh, because I was considering and I was waiting for an appointment to lead a church, he said, Brother Belton, he said, I think you ought to pray on it. He said, from, but from my perspective, he said, being the CEO of a local affiliate Urban League is, and these are his words, it is a <clears throat> secular call mm -hmm. to high intensity urban ministry. Mm -hmm. and that's exactly how we regard it, is my secular call to high intensity urban ministry. You're looking at expanding the organization yep. to cover Twin Cities as opposed to just Minneapolis. What's the status of that? So we are, our board of directors uh, is looking and is reviewing change of bylaws. We have to actually change our bylaws and our articles of incorporation uh, because our bylaws are written for us to be a Minneapolis based organization. That'll be done uh, early in the second quarter. So we're, we turn the second quarter in April now. So I actually expected to be done, finished at our April, our, not our April, but our May board meeting. Uh, and then we will officially flip the split switch. We've got a lot of ministerial things to do, like changing our website mm -hmm. and our web address and, you know, stationery and those kinds of things. We will officially become Urban League Twin Cities at that point. I'm looking for third quarter and then or early into the fourth quarter to actually establish programming. We're looking to partner mm -hmm. and we're looking for organizations in the East Metro to uh, set us up and to uh, engage us in uh, the kind of services that we do at the Urban League, beginning with the East Metro and St. Paul. Right now, about 22% of our clients and our services are from the East, are in the East already. Metro area already. So yeah. we are, in, in some ways, we're simply be announcing what we have already become. Mm -hmm. In the last couple of minutes here, Steve Belton, uh, what's the charge to ordinary citizens of our community, black community, first of all, uh, African descendant community, but then beyond that to the entire community. Uh, what do you think? So we have, um, and we, here's our, the secret sauce of what the Urban League does, and we offer programming in the areas of uh, workforce, so we put people to work. We work with employers to get uh, jobs, identify jobs in our industry, recognize value and in, in credentials. Uh, we do housing. Uh, we do educational programs and we do health. And the secret sauce is that we have, there's this odd acronym we use called RAT. And it, is, it stands for respect, mm -hmm. accountability, and if you do those two things, then you earn trust. Mm -hmm. And so what our community can do, what the community that supports and engages us, whether it's African Americans or whites or anyone else, is that they can engage along that same continuum. And so it's a matter of offering respect. We don't judge people where they are. We respect people and accept people where they are. And I would say to the broader community, get engaged. Find a place, get in where you fit in. So we've got lots of volunteer opportunities. We have two uh, auxiliaries at the Urban League. There's the Young Professionals, which is our under 40 group that are very active. And we have the Urban League Guild, which is open to men and women. Uh, who want to be able to support the programming, the policies, and the work of the Urban League and to raise money for us. And then the second is accountability. We don't simply accept people where they are and say you don't have to change because everybody, including myself, mm -hmm. can grow and change. And so we believe in becoming lifelong learners. And for those people who are trying to get into the workforce, get into housing, who need education, uh, who need changes in their health, it's a matter of developing a plan and moving along that plan and being held accountable for it. And then in terms of build trust, we look to engage trusted relationships across the broader community. We have lots of allies and supporters and people who are committed to the work and to the objectives of the Urban League. And that's what we can do. That's where we can all lean in. You stepped out of a day of testimony over at the state legislature to come here yeah, for yeah. this interview. What's, the, what's on the agenda at the state legislature? Right now we're looking at jobs bills today, um, particularly I testified this morning on one of the jobs bills and we are hopeful uh, to receive a direct appropriation from the legislature uh, for a consortium that we are in with four community-based organizations, Emerge, Stair Step Foundation, Sabathony, and the 
Urban League uh, to help provide jobs, put people to work, and to give them the training that they need to be able to stay in a training program, give them the support that they need. And so we're hopeful that the legislature will give us a direct appropriation as opposed to this intermediary strategy that a lot of philanthropic supporters and the legislature likes to do, which is to set somebody else up like DEED, the Department of Employment and Economic Development, to administer these grants rather than engaging with us directly. They can trust us, we do good work, we get good results, and we have the, both the accountability and the trust in the communities that we are serving. So and then this afternoon we're going to be working on uh, testifying around a Safe Streets Bill, which is a strategy uh, to promote uh, early intervention, uh, early violence intervention. And in our community, you still have many, many acts of violence, gang-related in some cases and others domestic violence, and we need strategies, boots on the ground work, uh, out of trusted community organizations to help that. And we're hopeful that the legislature will appropriate funds for us to be able to do that work. Steve Belton, at the end of the day, I hear you talking about establishing a new narrative, Absolutely. a new understanding, something that everybody can weigh into, sort of creating a public mind that reflects, number one, uh, the dignity and the genius of our people and our capacity to serve ourselves and in doing so serve humanity yeah. and to make our state, our communities better. But we have to be at the table and we have to understand and be willing to exercise the levers of power, power that we have in our own agency. What do you think about that? So I would say, first of all, it's not a new narrative. It is really recapturing the existing narrative. It's getting rid of those layers of false narrative about our community. But you're absolutely right. We need to drive our own story. We have the ultimate responsibility for taking charge of our narrative, of getting our story out there. Uh, part of what we have to do is to make sure people understand that it's not just a question of when we all do better, we all do better. There is data that shows when African Americans do better, because we are at the bottom mm -hmm. of these social indicators, then everybody does better. And so it makes sense that it is cost effective to invest in the challenges that are affecting our community. Steve Belton, thank you so much. It's a pleasure, Al. Have thank a you. great day. Thank you very much. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll see you again next time. Support for Conversations with Al McFarland was provided by Old National Bank Comcast Home Ownership Opportunity Alliance and North American Banking Company.